Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Creating Sustainable Long-Term Employee Engagement Through Trust. Um, I'm really excited for this one as A, we have a real expert in the field joining us today, and B, I really, really believe that trust is the glue to creating a happy and engaged workforce. And Sarah and I offline for about five minutes have been talking about this and we delivered the webinar to ourselves because we were so excited and passionate. So um, we had to suddenly go, oh, we better get online to speak to everybody. So here, here we are. So we came on smiling because we were, we were just so excited for today. So I'll be introducing Sarah uh, officially in just a second, but she'll be joining in with the conversation and the introduction as we go through. We've had a really good response to this webinar with over 100 people signing up via LinkedIn. So hopefully you've all from LinkedIn been able to find the Eventbrite Zoom link to be able to find your way through. Um, I can see the numbers are already flying up at the bottom of my screen so far. Um, but we'll give it just a couple of minutes to let everyone have a moment to jump on and get settled in. In our last webinar, we actually focused on supporting the mental health and well-being of remote employees in partnership with Steve Burrell and Newcastle United Foundation. If you haven't had a chance to listen to this one yet and you have remote teams and employees working for you or with you, then I really recommend tuning into our on-demand webinar recordings, which you can find at all of our previous webinars and supporting resources at www.stribehq.com. Now, staying on the topic of mental health and wellbeing, what's everyone signing on for just a second, Sarah? I'm not sure where you're based today, but I'm at home in my flat in London. and I'm looking out the window and it's absolutely scorching blue skies. Have you got the same where you are? I have, yes. It's uh, nice and sunny after a very rainy weekend because I'm in Manchester. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I do think that the, the marketing team may need to invest in an outdoor wellbeing area, in a webinar area. We can start to deliver these over the summer. I'm not sure whether that will go into the, into the winter months, but let, let's see what we can do going forwards with that one. Um, so whilst uh, we're waiting, there's a chat box at the bottom of your Zoom link and there's a Q&A box. If everyone signing up wants to click on those boxes, um, first of all, just while we let everyone kind of come on, if you want to say hello, and introduce yourself and where you're from into the chat box, please do so just to get to know one another. And also from the Q&A box point of view, I've got lots of questions to ask Sarah today, and I'm sure the chat will flow all the way through. But this is about um, audience participation. So we want you, our audience, to ask as much and as many questions as possible as you go through. So please do feel free to use both of those chat functions. But we'll be keeping our particular on the Q&A box. So please put the questions in there as, as, as we go through. Um, Sarah, just one more minute to everyone get on board. Um, one thing I like to ask all of our guests is, as a little icebreaker whilst we're waiting, is if you had to choose holding music whilst you wait for something to start, what would you choose and why? Oh, I think it'd have to be Human by The Killers because oh. I just absolutely love it for lots and lots of reasons. For good reasons, for bad reasons, just, yeah, that is like if I was on a desert island or had to have holding music, that, that would be my song. I think it's a great song. I was thinking about this and obviously I try and change it each time and, and, and suddenly on the radio this morning came on for me was Walking on Water by Katrina in the Waves. Now mm -hmm. I suddenly thought you know what where, where did that one come from but I noticed it first thing this morning and, and I've, I've had it on repeat all morning so that would be my song if we're waiting. I actually want the, the whole music to hold there for so long that we just didn't speak to the person that was there but there, there we go. <laughs> like it. So let's let's get on topic shall we? Um, thank you everyone for joining us and let, let's make a start. Um, a little introduction for those of you who are joining Stribe Sessions for the first time. Um, my name is Mike Brennan, co-founder and CEO of Stribe. At Stribe, we help teams to be heard taking their small insights day by day leading to real change that matters. We work with both private and public sector organizations, small and large, and our platform enables organizations to collect real-time insights from their people, which help organizations to achieve their key priorities. Staff engagement, experience, and retention are three key pillars that our technology and people teams support organizations with. And through active listening, we help organizations to move away from reactive survey models, enabling a proactive approach to supporting and engaging your number one asset, your people. So what does that mean? What do we actually do? Well, we've developed some very clever technology that allows organizations to deliver surveys, pulse surveys, pulse questions to capture real-time feedback and insights from your people. For example, you can even track groups of people's feedback such as onboarding experience of your new starts to support that retention through actively capturing their feedback. We have employee voice. You can listen to suggestions and concerns from any time and anywhere. Um, and we have smart resource hubs to make sure that you have the right information available at the right time for your people. So for example, really making sure people can access your wellbeing resources in your organization or your engagement experience policies and procedures. So it has to be in the hands of your people no matter where you are and where you're working from. 
And as part of our approach, we like to partner with the most forward thinking organizations uh, and leaders of people and talk about the most current and challenging topics which relate to employee engagement, well-being, communication, experience, ED&I. Um, so today we're aiming to explore how to create sustainable long-term employee engagement through trust. And to explore this, we're joined by the amazing Sarah Clark, business psychologist and director of Occupational Mind Group. Uh, Sarah, welcome. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Like you said earlier, um, we're, sort of, we're like, oh, we've already been chatting for five minutes. We better get on the webinar. <laughs> I'm, I'm desperate to fly through all of my notes at the start so I can speak to you because some of the stuff you said already just got me so excited. I'm sure our audience is going to absolutely love this. Um, but Sarah designs award-winning people and culture strategies and works with large-scale clients to deliver measurable benefits through the science of people. Um, and the Occupational Mind Group work with organizations, teams, and individuals to deliver strategic cultural change initiatives that deliver return on investment. Innovative methods underpinned by strong scientific evidence and combined with practical real-world business experience have yielded multi-million pound returns in less than 12 months. Audits of organizations, teams, or co location cultures help focus efforts to create a climate which promote innovation. I really like that. Clients have achieved external accreditations awards for cultural change programs delivered by the Operational Mind Group. And OMG measures success across hard and soft measures, including increased profitability, higher employee engagement, reduce sickness costs, employee productivity, and speed of innovation, and always delivers ROI. Their passion is using the science of human behavior to deliver impact with integrity. So Sarah, that's a very fancy introduction to Occupational Mind Group and yourself, but to start with and to introduce yourself to the audience, we wanna know about you. So perhaps you could introduce yourself to our audience and give us a little bit of an introduction of who you are, what you do, what you care about, all, all things Sarah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah no, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone. So. Yeah, that's the sort of uh, official uh, business um, kind of overview. Overview. So I'm Sarah. I am a business psychologist. Um, I started my career um, sort of getting on the graduate scheme. Worked at a large retail company. Um, led different teams. And then, as many people do, I then thought, you know what? There's, I, you know, this is sort of the, the the same thing. And I wanted to understand more. And I've been a psychologist ever since I I did my my degree, which I realised is over twenty years ago. But anyway, we'll we'll bypass that bit. Um, so I then did um, a master's in occupational psychology, accredited by the British Psychology Society, and it's all about how people interact. So it's to do with science, it's to do with the research, but, but when you look at people, we're all individuals, we've got our own thoughts, we've got our own feelings, we've got our own behaviours, and everything sort of goes around and sort of fits together, and, and it links into a lot of other things. But there, there, there's then also the situation, so as I started to sort of go back through my career and through what had happened and, and sort of different changes and also then obviously in the current climate with, with hybrid working I just think everyone should enjoy their jobs I think it's like it sounds a bit oh very fairy but if we enjoy what we're doing if we're engaged in what we're doing if we like doing our job we do a good job you know we we, we wouldn't want to leave we wouldn't want to move somewhere else or relocate and I think that's where the psychology and thank you for that great introduction comes into it because a lot of people don't always know what psychology is I mean I have people who sort of turn around and go can you read my brains no if I could <laughs> you know what we'd all be psychologists and actually I think that's what's really important with trust is everyone here and obviously we're, we're re remote in this setting but when we're um, all sort of you know in the, in the same room everyone is a psychologist you know when you meet someone if you sort of have that connection or if you think oh why do they do they fit with me or if you're a bit nervous or so we're all psychologists because there's so many underlying sort of things that that impact and factors that impact how we respond to people whether we trust them immediately whether we wait and trust them you know maybe six months down the line maybe we never trust them so it's all about that and it's the science behind it so I'm very lucky to get to work in lots of different organizations um big ones small ones lots two three years some for six months um and I'm really excited to be here to sort of talk about trust and obviously strive and, and how how that tool can help with employee engagement and and how you bring that to life Brilliant, Sarah. Well, we'll, we'll both the uh, the official uh, opening and also how you explained the, um, what you do and who you are was was, was brilliant. Right? And I I already learned more and more every time that we kind of speak through these different topics. So let's let's hone in in terms of trust, shall we? So the glue of an organisation we can all agree is trust. Well, particularly Sarah and I agree uh, at the start of the conversation. Hopefully by the end of it, all of you will. Um, when we trust our employees to work in ways they want to, they feel valued, respected, and engaged. 
These higher levels of engagement transform workplaces as employees that feel this way are more productive, loyal, and creative. Just sounds easy, doesn't it? Yeah. If, you pro- if you prioritize building trust, and hopefully this will become easier, you actually can create an employee experience tailored to the priorities and motivations of your workforce, and one that encourages them to stay at your organization and create their best work. Investing in trust now will save you a fortune in the future when it comes to the retention of your people. And as Sarah mentioned on LinkedIn over the weekend, trust has proven to improve performance, employee commitment, and even reduce stress. And people even say that trust is the most expensive thing in the world, which we'll come on to later on. So what does a trusting workplace look like and how can trust create sustainable long-term employee engagement? These are a couple of questions that we want to have as our kind of golden stars for today and we'll do our best to answer. So as I mentioned at the start, I have lots of questions to ask Sarah, but we'd like you, our audience, to ask as many questions as possible. Um, You will see that Q&A box at the bottom. Please click on it. Please add your questions. If you want a question to go to the top of the panel, click on the vote up button and it will pop all the way up. Sarah's been monitoring that. I'm monitoring it. So we may just pull those questions out as we go through. Um, So without further ado, let's get into this, Sarah. Sarah, what does trust mean to you in an organizational setting and indeed the wider setting? So trust is, um, you know, when you, when you look at the official definition um, in terms of sort of, um, you know, Oxford University and everything, and I am going to read it because it's quite, quite a mouthful. Please mouthful, do. But it is, it is a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, or the ability of someone or something. And this is why I think trust is so difficult for many organisations, because when you break that down, you're looking at reliability, right? So my perception of reliability might be different to someone else's perception of reliability you know in my mind I could be I need to be at meeting at 10 as long as I'm there by 10 past I'm reliable someone else might be well actually no reliable turning up five minutes early or it's it's a different perception again truth truth what is true and the best thing I could sort of say to everyone is if you think of the number six um, and if you think of you and your mate and one of you is standing at one side and one of you standing at the other side and you've got this giant number six on the floor, you could argue that you're staring at the number six. And you could also argue that you're staring at the number nine. And actually, you're both right. And so this this element of, of truth is different. It, it's not the same. You know, the psychological experiments that, that have been done show that you can watch the same thing we could both you know Michael and myself could be standing there next to each other literally watching the same thing and yet our perceptions of what happened could be completely different so I think it's this it's this sort of innate ability with with trust and trust is not static trust is a sort of you know many factors that that come into trust so for example one time I could I could talk to Michael and I could say Michael um, can you look after look after my bags or something right and when I get back he's not you know pilfered my wallet or done anything else or got you know got photos and I don't know what is it when you go on sort of you know LinkedIn and you put a silly post or, or whatever do you know what I mean so I've trusted him to to do yeah. that but when you look at the psychology of it actually a person giving someone a trust and so for me to say rather than just leave my bag there and just walk off actually for me to say do you know what excuse me can you look after my bags for me you know whether you know them whether you're in the train station or wherever that in itself is more likely to increase trust because you're you've got that conversation suddenly that person's real suddenly he can imagine my face as he's pilfering through my wallet or whatever so it is about the the human connection and and trust from a psychological point of view it is the glue that holds social relationships together. It is the glue that, that keeps everyone working. You know, it is, it is dyadic. Um, there's a trust model um, by Simpson, actually, and I think it was 2007. Um, that was all to do with the motives of the individual. That was all to do with the outcome of the joint decision. So if my motive is, I don't know, for example, in an organisation, I want to make a load of money, right? That's all I care about. As long as I make money, as long as I'm rich, as long as I get to drive it around in my Porsche, that's my motive. If as a, a founder or an owner or a leader, I'm there going, do you know what, actually, I really want to give back to the community or I want to do this. People will be thinking, well, there's a, there's a bit of a disjoint here because you're saying you want to give back to the community and yet you're driving around in a Porsche and, and things. So trust is all about the norms, the values, the beliefs. And it's also perceptual because for some people, if they drive around and have three or four Porsches, they'd think I was weird only having one. But for other people, I just need to point out I haven't got a Porsche, I'm just putting, putting that out there. But um, <laughs> if you have that perception, people always aspire to be better. So people always go, well, I want to progress, I want to improve. 
And I think that's where trust really comes into it because every organization needs to embrace trust. They need to talk about it. I think a lot of companies are, I think like you said, uh, Mike, sort of early on, engagement is a measure of trust, it's a symptom, right? If, if people aren't trusting in an organization, your engagement's gonna be low. Just as diversity and inclusion and, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the communication, it's all a benefit on trust. And, and as part of that in an organization, it's knowing that as you do something, whatever it is, you're expecting some sort of reciprocation, but it's having that positive intent. Because for example, I don't know, Michael might be 10, late, 10 minutes late to my meeting, but actually if something really horrific happened before then, it's great you made it. Do you know what I mean? So it's all about the situation. It, it's fluid. It's not a, it's fixed. You know, I 100% trust you. It, it can change, it can ebb, it can flow. Self-perception is another one. If you wake up and you're having a bad day, chances are you're less likely to trust people. So it's a real complicated, um, yeah, glue almost that sort of changes throughout an organisation. Does that sort of answer yeah. the question? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm scribbling notes left, right and centre here. And, and, and yes, it, it, it does. As I think that's... I do a lot of talks and supporting organizations to get these uh, more regular feedbacks. So looking at kind of not just doing your annual survey process because that's a measure of engagement and therefore trust once a year. And yeah. as you say, there's a whole fluid 12 months between that and we sped it up to six months and then even pulsing can be quarterly, but actually mm -hmm. it's, it's that daily living, breathing thing that you build up from your individual self, then into your teams and your groups, however many that might be. And then from that organizational leadership point of view, and you all have to be agile in your approach to supporting one another. And one of the challenges that we find working with organizations is different outcomes seem to drive different measures. So mm -hmm. people, people box well-being, they box engagement, they box ev &I, they box all these different things. Actually, it's how you have them all inclusively together. And I see it as kind of trust is that kind of nucleus your atoms yes, around that are effectively all the points I just mentioned of your engagement, your well-being, your inclusion, your EDI scores, and everything that comes with that. And then on the outside of that shell is your retention of keeping that all together with that, because you can have for a two-month period all of that working. But like you say, the moment that trust is broken from something, from a, a director to a manager, from a, a, an employee to a manager the other way around, there's a there's a gap in that shell and that nucleus and it leaks and it causes different problems so uh, for me that makes complete sense in terms of keeping trust as that kind of holding beacon in the middle and how we as organizations support measure and nurture that is, is is ultimately what can become the success so my next question was going to be why is trust the most important thing for organizations to focus on but Sarah, i think you answered that in your journey of explaining that through so we might come back to that just to kind of recap why mm -hmm. is that important um I touched on it briefly in the introduction, but from your own point of view, can you just talk through a couple of the points of the benefits? Like, what are the benefits of trust when we get this right or we continue to focus on it? What what happens that's good in an organisation? And, and I think this is where, and it, it does link, link into sort of, you know, um, sort of the, the, important, the importance of trust as well and then the, the, the benefits. So trust is, is proven and there's loads of research to increase engagement, increase productivity. Um, companies that go in and, and, and try and increase trust, for example, actually people go, well, what, what are you doing? Is that real? So, so, so we call it, like you say, different things. So we say, well, we've got an employee engagement um, you know, initiative or we're working on inclusivity or we're improving feedback mechanisms. And I think the key with trust is, is, it, is it does sort of you know, un underpin it all. So one of the key things with it is, is it, if you imagine an organization that is trusting, okay? So you imagine an organization that is trusting, okay? So for example, um, leader in the organization says, I need X by Y, okay? Person in the team goes, right, I can do X by Y, okay? And let's, let's, let's keep it something simple. So let's pretend it's a bike ride, okay? So the leader yeah. wants you to go on a bike ride because we can all sort of associate, associate that with or without whether we ride bikes. And the leader says to them, uh, I need you to go on a bike ride. Um, we're going to go together and it needs to be a really good one. OK, so the person sort of working with them or for them and, and it can vary depending on it, or a project team or whatever goes, OK, we need to deliver a bike ride and it needs to be a really good one. OK, we can do that. Now, if there's then no more communication, my version of a really good bike ride is down the road into the pub to drink gin and tonic. My leader's version of a bike ride might be 
50 miles up and down mountains, camping in a tent, we'll be back tomorrow, kind of bike ride. So you need to start to instill that trust. So I need to feel safe to go, okay, well, talk to me about a good bike ride. What good bike rides have you been on? What is it that makes it good? And the leader might go, well, actually, it's not for me. It's for someone over there who wants the bike ride. So I go, okay, well, talk to me about them. And you start to build up. Now, if when I go to my leader and I go to, and they go, I'm so stupid, it's a good bike ride. Well, okay, so I'll go back and come up with what I think is a good bike ride. So this is where trust becomes because I've got to be vulnerable to go to my leader and say, I don't really understand what you mean by good bike ride. Okay, I don't really understand what, what, what this concept is. And depending on how my leader or whoever it is that sort of commissioned this, even sort of, you know, customers as such, if they're then quite like, you know, don't waste my time or I'm busy or whatever, it can really impact trust because then I think, well, I'm not going to go back and I'm not going to ask, a, you know, uh, the best ones when people say, oh, don't ask stupid questions, you know, no question is, is stupid. But then someone asks the question and they sort of go, yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> yeah, and you think you're yeah. saying, trust me, but in reality, your behaviours, the unconscious stuff isn't. Now, equally, it can go too far the other way. So keeping on the bike ride idea, if my leader um, sort of says to me, right, I want to go on a bike ride, and I go, okay, fine, and we set off, and all they're doing is saying, right, lift your foot up, put your pedal down, lift your foot up, put your pedal down. Don't forget we're coming to a corner. Turn to the right, turn to the left. It can be that micromanaged that I think they don't trust me yeah. to take them on a bike ride because they're telling me and annoying me to do everything. So I thought, I think, do you know what? Just do it yourself. Actually, I don't need that. I'll, I'll, I'll get you to do it yourself. So trust is about how you work together. And the more trust you get, and you can think about this in your own organization, the quicker things get done because I'm not there talking to all my colleagues going, person A is asked for this. What do you think? Let's come up with our best guess. Um, you also can be innovative because they might say, right, I want you to go on a bike ride. And I might go, do you know what? I think we should walk because looking at it, I can get you from A to B. And rather than riding this big bike ride, unless that's the purpose of it, we can just go straight across there. And does that fulfill what, what, what the outcome is? So it is about this sort of dyadic model and communication. And you see organizations invest thousands in communication um, sort of, you know, training and, you know, um, unconscious bias training. And but it all relates to trust. Because at the start of it, not many people join an organisation not wanting to trust that organisation. And most people will join it going, right, I love this organisation. I want to be successful. They want me to be successful. Let's go. But then slowly over time, the trust starts to maybe break down. It doesn't lift up to expectations. And there's loads of, you know, there's loads of financial impacts. Um, I think it's about 18 percent increase in productivity. If you have a high trust organization from some of the research that was done I think that was Howard Watson who did that research so there's a lot out there that shows why trust is so important but it's very difficult because I can't just turn around to you and say can you go on a good bike ride can you make it good and trust me because it's the outcome that that, that may happen and it's that communication sorry that probably doesn't answer the question ish but I, it's trying to give no, a real it, example <laughs> it, it, it certainly did to me because I think you know when you look at the benefits so it's all it's all well and good saying you know these numbers and these stats and everything with it, but it's these real life examples are so important. It helps to, to, to sort of picture the benefits. I'm, I'm a very visual learner and I'm, I'm, I'm a young leader personally. We have 10 employees in our business and I'm trying to get it all right for my team, my people. Some are younger than me, some are older than me. Um, I'm a very, very trusting individual. Um, mm -hmm. I understand that that gets everyone bought in as I feel at the start. But where I've gone wrong at times is I've, 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 I've had to micro measure uh, certain parts of my business because the pressure's outside that uh, from investors from shareholders from getting it right mm -hmm. from a COVID perspective um, and actually COVID one good outcome that came for me was we had to become outcome driven or I, I had to be out, become outcome driven so I had to flip the model um, of how I explained the bike ride per se or how I felt yeah. I needed to communicate the bike ride. Because you couldn't and, see it you couldn't see the person doing it. you couldn't look at them and go well they're here you couldn't see any no. of it because we were all remote. And also you have to become adaptable in your, your, your leadership skills to learn that you can't just go around and repeat the same uh, tasks of up and down, mm -hmm. up and down for those that don't need it. Some people get annoyed by that. And actually it took, it took me about five or six months to work out, you know, some people just need to know there's the outcome. There's just let me go and get that. And I trust them over time with that. 
and others, I need to put more pressure on to be checking in daily to say, are we on the right way? Are you aware of my vision? Are we doing this? Are we doing this? Are we doing this? But all the while we're working towards that mountain, if that's the case. But I think that's that's really important in terms of the benefits of building the trust, bring mm-hmm. out things like communication, bring out things like an understanding of each other's attitudes and 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 caring for one another, both in work and outside mm-hmm. of that, builds that flexibility of, 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 of the trusting parts that we need. When it's a good day, it's a great day. And when it's a bad day, just know when to pull back and support someone and pick up some of that slack on the bike ride. So yeah. I, I, I think there's lots of different benefits that organisations can can explore over time. Um, how do you know if you've got the trust of your employees? It's, it's such a big question, but we're going on this journey of, okay, the benefits are great. So going back a step, how, how do we know if we've got, as leaders, the, the, the trust of our employees? I think the, the, the big thing with um, the, the, the trust of employees is whether you, um, first of all, whether you can see it, whether the behaviours um, and things that are consistent um, within that. So whether, for example, um, you know, you sort of, you're looking at, um, you know, the, the, the employees in the organisation and say I'm right at the top of the organisation, if that makes sense. So I'm looking around, I'm going, oh, everyone, everyone trusts each other. You know, I'm in my team, I go on my team away days, we all trust each other. And then across, and I mean, I mean I'm imagining quite a large organisation here. Yeah, yeah. Um, in some of the other teams, there might be, well, I trust my team, right? I'm in marketing, for example, no sort of, you know, 20 yeah. marketers who may be here, but I'm in marketing, so I trust my team. I'm not sure I trust those lot over there because do you know what? They maybe don't do this or they don't do that or, you know, their version of a good bike ride looks look slightly different. Um, so I think the important thing when you start to try and look for trust is you have to look at on an organisational um, level. So you need to go, well, OK, they may struggle with some trust because actually they don't know each other. They don't understand that, you know, if you think going back into this bike example, the mechanics team need to be very precise they need to be very accurate and they need to make sure that everything is, is as it should be. Whereas someone who's maybe, I don't know, doing the PR for the market, for the marketing, for the bike ride or whatever it is we're doing, actually can be quite creative. They can do, you know, they're very different skills. And I think this is where measuring it and understanding it across your organisation is really difficult. So one of the things we do a lot, and this is probably where um, Stride could also be used as well, is we do a cultural audit. And as part of that, we measure trust. We measure some other things, but we also measure trust. Because trust is a perception. You know, I could trust you 110% and then suddenly tomorrow, after you saying for ages you were going to do X, something happens and you do Y. And this is where it's really important because actually if you explain to me, you know, if you say, well, you know, take COVID, for example, we were going to do X, this is Y. And actually what's happened is I've had to change my mind. You know, you you mentioned earlier about the sort of, you know, for a few months you've been like, I don't know, I'm thinking about it being open about that having that conversation you know this whole all leaders have the answer is is, it's not the way you know the best leaders bring a good team together and they let the person who's the expert at the time lead for whatever it is that that needs to be done and that's where we get innovation now the only way we can do that is if we do you know underpin the 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 trust and 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 are, are prepared to be vulnerable there are measures and um, there's loads of different measures to do with um, trust. You can just Google trust um, and trust psychology and some measures will come up. But it's also really important to pick it specific to the organisation and it needs to be safe. So one of the things I would say with trust and, and organisations that maybe do have trust as a KPI, it's not about being 100% and, you know, we're 99% trust. Actually, when I go into those organisations, and it does sometimes happen where there's one team who's sort of down here and there's one team who's up here. The first team I'm looking at is the one that's up here yeah. because they're not, you know, it's, it's a bit like, well, I've got this amazing cake and it looks great inside. It's not. But on the outside, it is. So it, it is, it's multidimensional. And I would say if you want to do it in your organisation, the best thing to do is get a blank piece of paper, put in the different departments, put in maybe your customers as well and, and whoever it is that, that you're sort of serving. Put in if you've got a board or anything. Literally, you'll end up, uh, you know, blobs with it. And just think, what personally for you, where do you feel that you that you trust? You know, and and for some people it will be quite small. I might only deal with the person who sits next to me. For directors, for leaders of organisations, it must be might, might be much broader. But again, as and going back to what we talked about, it might be in a different level of detail. So I might trust that things happen, and um, but we do bike rides, right? 
I might not know the detail of that, but I trust it. So it's all about also knowing to let the experts do it and, and, and having that two-way communication. Um, but it is difficult. And there are some questions. I've got a couple that I'll sort of share to, toward the end that are just quite, they're quite good, good questions. But if you ask about integrity, if you ask about credibility, if you ask things about does my organisation do what it says it will? And at times you have to break trust, unfortunately. There are times when the world changes and what looked good the day before suddenly is completely different so actually you do have to say do you know what the situation's changed um i need you know i need i need to break trust um and again situations are important because like you said um at times people need to take the lead you know if there's a fire in this you know virtual building then that'd be interesting but we were in a yeah. building there's a fire i want one person who knows what they're doing to say right do this, do that, have that door, wait there, you're safe. I don't want us to have a big collaborative meeting about what's the best way to get out, who, how do we include everyone, you need direction. And, it, and, and I think that's what you were saying, it's about direction. And then it's about that sort of, you know, that, that sort of support and guidance. And you, you turn it up and turn it down as a leader, which builds trust from that. I completely agree. And, and just taking out two of the points that you've talked through there, Sarah, sort of, it's come back to this kind of communication pillar around trust because they're so intrinsically linked. Mm -hmm. One's around this kind of continual stroke agile approach to sense checking. So you're mentioning about, we'll come back to the questions in a second, but you're mentioning some of the, the types of questions that you might ask, but it's also making sure that you're asking them in a frequency that you can just measure whether they have, are changing or they're not. It doesn't need to be every day. Nope. Equally, it doesn't need to be once a year. But it's finding a balance that works for you so that there's a temperature check in line with board meetings so that actions can be taken if if tr trust is reducing for example but it's got to be part of that day to day and and my final point to that and i love your thoughts on that is is then the two-way conversation this 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 mm -hmm. you said we did 360 degree loop that we really focus on supporting so not just asking a question it's what you do with that what but it's a lot of it's the comms with what you do with that and telling people that you've not got the answers or you have got the answers and that, that builds towards trust, doesn't it? By by doing yeah. that and speaking to people. I mean, a lot of organisations that I've worked with, um, sort of quite a, quite a few that five, six years, the time's gone a bit weird because I think we just lost a couple of years we locked out. Yeah, we but did. A number of years ago, probably about eight, 10 years now ago, actually thinking about it, employee engagement became a thing, right? It became popular. People were talking about it. Everyone went out and got employee engagement survey. And actually at the time that was really dangerous because if you don't, care enough to make a difference don't ask the question if that makes yeah. sense there yeah. has to be a reality so if you if you ask me a question and say how are you feeling today sarah and i go do you know what actually pretty rubbish not good x has happened and you go all right anyway and move on <laughs> yes. there could be two there could be two elements right there could be you've just been through whatever bad thing i've just mentioned to you there could be you don't know how to deal with it and you're like okay didn't mean to ask that don't ask the question then. Do you know what I mean? Don't, if you don't want to, but it's also the communication because then you can go, well, you know, if for example, you're asking a question once a week, right? And, and suddenly mine's down and you're then in the board explaining why there is, is, is down and, and, and things. And you go, well, actually there's is down because this has happened because I don't know, the bike broke or, you know, something happened or actually they, the, someone else fell off and they had to go and run and help them. So do you know what? The figures are all really low. A lot of it's knowing the reason why. If the why? reason why is I was really lazy, drank too much gin and couldn't get back on my bike, actually other, other people will trust you to come and have a very um, open and honest conversation with me to actually yeah. say, and this is where trust comes in, it can feel quite bad because you should come and say, do you know what, Sarah, we're paying you to do a job here. I expect X. You know, drinking too much gin and falling flat. I mean, yeah. I love this. I just, I always have <laughs> tangents. But anyway, but you can liken it to work. You yes. need to come and have that conversation with me and say, this is not acceptable because otherwise, all the people who are watching going, well, hang on a minute, she got away with doing that. Well, why can't I? It's not fair. I got yeah. up at nine o'clock. I did this. I got up at seven. So it, it's a trust that goes like two or three ways because if you don't have that awkward conversation with me, the trust can start to diminish with others, you know, and, and with organisations, I think one of the biggest things that's happening with the great resignation at, at the moment and, and the great reshuffle, whatever you want to term it, because people have different names, is there's people who 
have joined organizations they've been promised x so for example they say we're flexible or they say we're yep. you know we're inclusive or whatever it is but when they actually join it's not that and and because the barriers to entry have disappeared and because you don't just have to work somewhere where you can drive 20 minutes you can work you know anywhere as we we, we prove people are more open now to pick where they want to go which is where trust is becoming so important uh, at the moment, it's all about psychological safety. It's all about engagement because you can pick. If you don't want to work at that organisation and people are, they're picking up and going somewhere else. And it's that trust. But there's also the trust and the, the, the ability to give people time because equally you can't then expect people to just fix it the day after. So if you say to me, you know, I, you give me some feedback, you can't expect me to have mended the bike the day after, for example, or, you know, so, yeah. so it is about time as well and the situation, but it's understanding each other. And yes, it is communication, but but there's a positive intent there. Mm. There is a, you know, a positive intent that you're trying to do your best rather than um, you're just trying to hit the target. So, I mean, which we used to do because when I first started my career, a measure of success was if you were first in the office and last out of the office. Yeah. It didn't matter what you did the rest of the time. No. That was the measure of success and, and yeah. trust and, and everything is different now. And, and and I completely agree with that. And I think that's we're in a, a really interesting evolution, aren't we? Where we're 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 you know we're talking about hybrid working or flexible working and how that works. And really interesting in, in particularly in the public sector, it's it's a seesaw because you've got services that have to be in at certain points in time to clock in, clock out, and they have to deliver the service. They can't just sort of sit there and, and, and hide behind anything. And you've got others that are working extremely hard but can't get into an office because they need two or three screens. It's easier to work from home and they prefer it for all the reasons and they can actually get more done. And there's a lot of perception challenges right now mm -hmm. that it's very, very delicate, particularly from leaders to managers and then managers to their teams portraying what's expected of them. Um, and I think we keep hearing more and more in these surveys that we deliver in these sense checks and these measures that organization doesn't trust me. And I think, mm -hmm. and there's a question up here, which I'm going to sort of lead into, for, but thank you very much for sharing it, which is, uh, does trust have to come from senior levels down or can it be pushed up from lower levels? My answer is it has to be both. Because if mm -hmm. we've got being pushed down with all the right intent, that the, the lower levels aren't prepared to listen or they're frustrated because they're not feeling trusted, where actually it's reality of their job and their role, that's really, really dangerous if that me measure and communication isn't aligned and vice versa. If someone on that front line is giving everything, they're working through the nights to get that presentation done, but the manager then just says, well, why wasn't that on my desk <laughs> at nine o'clock? Well, I haven't been to bed yet. So the best presentation I could for the first time. I'm nervous. I'm not delivering it. Mm. You've got a clash there and a break of trust. So uh, what, what's your views on that, Sarah, in terms of the, I, the, the senior levels and the lower levels? Yeah, and, it's, and it, is a, it is a brilliant question because it does have to be both. Um, but not only does it have to be said at both sides, it needs to be actually physically there. You know, it needs to be part of the behaviours. It needs to be part of what really happens. So, for example, go back to our, our letter six, right? So, you know, if you imagine all the senior people in the organisation are standing one side looking at number six, and then all the sort of people who are frontline, you know, might be miles away from the sort of, you know, the boardroom and the senior things. They know the detail. They know, you know, they're the people who, if we're going with the bike example, are sort of, you know, fixing the tiny little hydraulic gears or whatever. They're looking at it and going, it's number nine. And you've got two people on two sides. And what's happening is the leaders are shouting louder because they do have a bit more power. They're going, no, it's number six. And the people there are going, no, I'm sure it's number nine. And, and, and there's a huge sort of wave of culture that can happen where it gets to the point that all the people that are looking at a number nine are going, it's just not worth it. I'm tired. So I'm going to move on. They're disengaged. They're not happy because they're, they're so tired of saying it's a number nine. But then you've also got all the leaders are going, well, trust us, just trust us. It's a number six. And you've got this communication thing that, that just sort of goes backwards and forwards. Now, in reality, they're both right. So you, you always need to try and make it is really hard to do, but you need to start to look at, well, what are the pressures of my leader? OK, so my leader wants to do a good job. Right. And their pressure might be deliver on 20 percent profit, whatever it is, increase whatever, do whatever they need to do. You then have to look at it from the people who are on the front line who know the detail, who really understand, who get customers berating them every day. Or, you know, I mean, the customer complaints team, it, it's always interesting to sort of talk to them because their job is negative feedback. Right. That, that's what yeah. they do every day. Yeah. Negative feedback. 
And if you sort of then talk to them compared to someone else on the other side, who's maybe sort of more customer facing, it's a different perception, but like our number, it's all right, it's all okay. So I think it's definitely both. I do think it is also important that people understand what trust is, because I think what can happen and does happen is um, that, and, and there's been a few examples with organisations, they've gone in and they said, right, we're going to do feedback, okay? So the, 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 the bosses bring in some feedback training or something. Everyone does feedback, but the leaders don't want to hear the feedback. So they, they, they say, yeah, yeah, we want feedback. And when the feedback is, well, do you know what? Actually, this, the bosses maybe feel uncomfortable. They shut down. They're not keen. So there is a real thing about actually it's trust. You know, you've got to trust that the people on the front line, whatever it is they're doing, they're doing the right thing. And the leaders are doing the right thing. And also it's a different thing with roles. You know, the, the, what you said about hybrid working is, I used to trust people were working because they were in early and then they left late. They're working hard. They've just done 12 hours. In reality, the outcome might have been completely different. They might yeah. not have been doing stuff. They might have been, I don't know, drinking coffee or whatever. Yeah. But they seem to be doing what they were doing. Now, people can work, and particularly with artificial intelligence, some of the tech things, people can work and get things done, and machines can get things done a lot faster than, than they sort of, you know, ever could before. So there is that element of, I can't see what's going on, but... Is that really what, you know, the lead wants to happen? So, I mean, when I first um, sort of started work, and you'll probably work out which company this is from LinkedIn, but anyway, um, one of my bosses said, we're going to try all remote working, okay? And they said, we're going to try remote working and your team's been picked, right? So I want you to work remotely. I want you to, you know, they were sort of downsizing head office and, and things that com companies do. So we're like, fine, we can do that. So there's a number of us. Anyway, I got hauled up in front of one of the directors at about six months. And they said, right, well, I, I've, got, I've got an issue. You're known as the part-time team. Well, well, you're never in. So-and-so walked past my desk at half past 11 this morning. And do you know what I mean? You're never in. And I was like, but you've asked us to embrace remote working. Yeah. And I said, I've got two rules. And again, this is where your trust comes in. One is that I can always contact them. And if I can't contact them, I know why I can't. It was then an emergency, as always happens in these teams. And by God, all my team were there. They were there with bells on because there were people there who, for the first time, they'd been to see their kids' sports day. For the first time, because they were remote working, they were enjoying themselves. And this is kind of what's happening at the moment. They're enjoying themselves. But the perception, now, had I not been quite as strong as I was, um, and this is what sort of gets, gets got me into culture, I probably would have gone, oh, I'm really sorry, I'll get them in at nine o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. And I didn't. Yeah. I sort of said, hang on a minute, you asked me to do this. I've done it. I did say, look, wait another four weeks because then all the outcome will, will, will come out and you'll see. And actually our, our output improved like 33%. It was like that. And we, we did more. We did what the team enjoyed it. You know, the retention went up. And I mean, that was quite a small example. But at the time, and this was 20 years ago, I mean, it was a while ago, it was a different culture. It was a different mm. way of working. Whereas now COVID has meant that you can be at home. You know, you... You, you, you know, it's not like that. Oh, you're watching, you know, whatever the I can't remember, Jeremy Carl, but things been cancelled. Yeah. But you know what I mean? If you ever yes. said I'm doing, I'm working from home, they go, oh, enjoy Jeremy Carl, enjoy your day yes. off. Yeah. It's not like that. You can do no. work wherever, if that makes sense. The only place I think you really can't work is on a roller coaster, I've decided. I was thinking about this. I'm thinking, where can you really not work? You know, people work in gyms. Their mind's thinking about work. They're thinking about it. They're swimming up and down the lanes and they suddenly have that. Yeah that's the solution so we don't have to be where we are that said if we're working in a factory if we're in a and &E helping patients we need to be there because that's the role we do so it is role yes. specific and there is quite a good model that's about what's the role and where's the organization but also then what about the rest of the team really really powerful and you prompted a great com uh, question from anna burtbeck if i may read it out to you sarah and there's a little question at the end so Trust is multifaceted, multifaceted, if I can say it, sorry. I can trust my team members to get on with the job in hand and to work towards our goals and targets. And I can trust my CEO leader to set the strategic direction. However, working for a scaling company, constantly changing to adapt to the changing environment, fears over job security is something that can cause competitiveness and in turn suspiciousness among team members, particularly when working across remote teams. What advice can you give to combat this? 
there's a um there's a brilliant um and it's actually it's actually an experience quite often these these are always quite useful so um and i can i can share if i share the link with you, you sort of we'll it share it afterwards can, yeah fantastic. you can sort of you can sort of do it yourself so there's a brilliant um sort of thing that you that, that i quite often use as part of a workshop but, but you can use it yourself so what you do is you get people into groups of teams so you say four teams right and at the start of it and someone might go oh, i've done that and you get into say four teams and you get them in a room and say, right, you're all one company, but what I want you to do is I want you to come up with some team names. So you get the four teams coming up with names and then all of them come up with names and then you give them red and green cards. And you say, right, if you hold a red card and you hold a green card, you get 30 quid, you get 10 quid. If you both hold red cards, you get 40 quid. And if you, if one of you holds, both holds green, you only get five. So and it is, I'll share the sort of the, the actual sort of figures on it. What happens is over time is people realize that if I shaft them and get my red card versus their green card, my team does better than theirs. And some people think it's a great idea. Some people feel really guilty. Some people then, what you do is you group to then go and talk to the other group. So you have a spokesperson. So you have one spokesperson who gets to go talk to their spokesperson and they agree. And, you, and the idea is yeah. if you agree the principle of let's always hold up red cards or whatever cards they are, you all get the same amount of money. But it just means that the company is a success. Anyway, by the end of it, there's an absolute outroll. They're all competing with each other. They're trying to take each other out. They're fibbing there. And it happens every time. And then at the end of this, take about an hour is quite a good time. You go, right, so the current success of this company is minus whatever. And they go, oh, yeah, we were all the same company, weren't we? And, and people are competitive. You know, people are, they do want to. You know, they do want to beat people. You know, some people don't, but most people do. And it's about understanding that actually, if you bring in that safe competitiveness, if you bring in that, you know, like like you said earlier, actually, someone comes in to help you with the bike ride, or when you're a bit slower, someone helps you, someone supports you. That's where it's really important because I then trust that you know what, if you know, I if suddenly I I don't know something bad happens, right, and I can't do it, or I'm off sick, or something beyond my control actually someone else is going to step in and help and and mm. i think in the past information was always sort of power so it was like the more information i have the the sort of higher up the chain i suppose you, yeah. you can get but yeah. actually in small scaling companies you do need to be honest with them you know you do need to say our runway is currently six months but if we do this we're going to get another 12 months and there is a real type of you know we've done quite a bit of personality things there's a real type of people who love scaling companies mm. because they love that you know the the, the mundane big fill in the form here's the processes which is great for the large conglomerates people who are scaling but also don't over promise don't promise it's going to be a success because do you know what you don't know so be honest with that you know to build that trust say do you know what actually i'm not sure but this is what we're doing x y and z to make it a success this is what your role is and i think the biggest one with the scaling companies is think about the motivation of the person giving you the advice so you've got people in scale ups who are you know it's their it's their ingenious idea they know it inside out they're amazing at whatever it is they've invented but then you have others who are brilliant at say leading teams or are good at the finances or are good at so it's all about shifting as well because there's quite a lot of scale ups that probably after about five ten years suddenly they've got the wrong people there and the trust yeah. starts to break down that's not because that person is wrong or anything else it's just because the situation's changed so you're in a different situation so that's how you can then improve trust by having the conversation going do you know what the situation's changed let's have a conversation right you're not enjoying it okay well actually this isn't working what what would suit you what would suit you and you see people move jobs they move across they can do different things and that's really important with, with scaling but again it's difficult, but if you do something like that, it does work. Again, it depends on your industry. So I'm really sorry, Anna. I don't know what industry you're on, but in some industries, it's really competitive. And in others, it's very different. So again, it depends on your industry. But I'll, I'll send that sort of team building thing out because it's really easy to do. You need some paper and the confidence to stand up in front of everyone. Um, and it's not related to your work. So you can then link it back into work when you've done it with the, with the team. That's really powerful, Sarah. And Anna, my, my only thoughts that I was just kind of thinking through some of the work that we do with organisations from that kind of pulse question and survey point of view is, is yeah. back to what Sarah said before, which is just how do we understand the why? And a lot of it, is in, in, depending on the level of trust you've got, will depend on probably the amount of anonymity you need to have around the way you ask your questions for fear of repercussions or the suspiciousness or the competitiveness that comes through. But if you can get that kind of qualitative why a person or if you're thinking of different team members or different groups are feeling the way they are, 
there may be similarities and patterns in which you can then communicate back to them in the same way. So you might have four or five different strands in which you need to rebuild the trust with that, that game like Sarah mentioned. But the work that we do is go, okay, let's look at this from different identifiers rather than that person's around that area and then say, what can we do with that? But we've got to get to that kind of why, if it's just the what, 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 there's a missing yeah. bit of what we can do with that then. And the, the why is the key. I mean, one of the big indicators and going all the way sort of back full circle is whether you've got high trust in your organisation yeah. is when you get a load of queries. Um, I'm only going to answer this if it's anonymous. Do you know what? You've not got trust in your organisation. You, yeah. You're there. You know, now that's not to say it's actually more a higher level because there tends to be this sort of power differential. Yeah. So people are like, well, I don't want to be known for the person who I don't know, moaned about whatever it is. So yeah. you've got to always think, what is the motive? What is it? When you're asking your questions on Stribe or, or however you're doing it, think what's going to change as a result of this? So, And you can ask people, you know, again, trust is, I can't guess what the answer is. So, for example, um, in, you know, sort of blanket engagement things that people used to do, although they seem to be shifting it now, I would think maybe that, um, I don't know, giving you cinema vouchers or something is engaging, right? Because I would enjoy that, you might not. So it's all about understanding the individual yeah. and trusting them in what they say. So if they sort of say one thing, you then trust that actually that is where they're coming from. But let them be themselves. They might go, oh, I hate the cinema. I, do you know what I mean? I don't like big crowds. I'd rather do this. Or, you know, and this is where perk box and some other things come in because you can pick. Do you know what I mean? You get a yes. reward and you can do it. But again, rewards are shown to not be that effective. No. You know, there was an experiment to do with an aeroplane where they put everyone on and said, first person out gets a thousand pounds. The whole aeroplane was absolutely sort of total and swaggered. You can look at it on YouTube. It was a psychological experiment because in reality, if we get out that door, you survive or you don't survive. Yeah. But what really works and what's been shown to work is if we all work together. And if we all work together on the plane, we all get out. And, and you know, it's sort of trying that. So, and it's hard in a startup because the pressure is huge. You have yeah. only got so long. Um, but equally in large companies, it's, it's, the pressure can be huge. And that then sort of links to well-being and the, the trust. You know, people say, well, we really care about well-being, but you've got to get this done. So yeah. if you need to work through the night. So again, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's that, it's that it's balance, that isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, we've, got a, we've got a couple more minutes left. And I, I, I think one thing that's sort of coming through, and, I, and I've learned a hell of a lot, is that we can almost sit here and say, okay, how can you achieve this for the long-term element? But for me, we've already answered that in terms of it's just this always living always breathing working hard together and making sure it almost is a starting project in terms of measuring trust so what i'd like to do and, and leave our audience with is just a couple of good questions that you touched on them before but like what 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 questions could people put into the next survey or verbally to their team when they go back after this call that could just get a gauge or a gorge as to where where trust is within the organization how, how do we start to measure that would be a great kind of final question i think for today I think, I mean, the first thing to do, and this is probably a really easy one to do, particularly with sort of things that are going on, people bring in lots of new people, is when you bring someone on, um, after about eight weeks, and you, and you can do this in two bits, and, and you can do this, um, I, I'm pretty sure you can strive to do this, but you can, if not, you can yeah. do something else. But you basically, before they come on, right, at the point you've offered them the job, you ask them a couple of questions of, what are you most excited about joining us? What are you really, what really stuck out to you in the interview? what made you pick us if that makes sense so real you know and, and you frame them you word them to suit your organization because again it is about you know how you fit it to the organization yeah. yeah and then after about six weeks you ask the same questions again it actually doesn't matter um you know sort of almost like what the answers were it's did you know and you you it comes up on it and you say right this is what you said right so what was important i don't know flexibility okay did we meet your expectations? Did we exceed your expectations or did we miss your expectations? And the key is if you miss expectations, you then go on and go, well, okay, how did we miss them and what can we do? So if it's a case that in the interview, everyone's about flexibility, but the new boss that actually is there needs people to be on site and deliver the role, don't then promote flexibility. It won't be someone's, in, it won't be an individual sort of responsibility who's going, oh, I'm going to try and do, undermine this trust, but it's the process. So, and there are other questions for things like, um, do you feel that you're being treated fairly? Mm. Um, but time bound it. Because if I say, do I feel I've been treated fairly? I don't know, depends, you yeah. know, say yeah. in the last week. Yeah. But then time bound it because at times organizations do make a huge sort of shift um, and that's important. But as part of that, 
start to look at the whole picture. So start to look at, and there's a brilliant um, book actually, it's by Ken Blanchard and it's about trust and it's trust works or trust matters. But what he does is he really looks at the, is the person able to do this? So your first question as any leader is, are they able to do this, right? And the second is, do they want to do this? So I might want to ride this bike, going back to our bike example, yeah. but I've never been on my bike before and I don't know how to ride it. So I might want to do it. I might learn how to do it. But like you say, it might take me a bit longer. It's also then, am I believable? You know, if I'm saying I want to do this, but actually I'm too busy at the pub drinking gin in my example for whatever, yeah. um, I'm not then very believable. But actually, if the reason I'm not believable is because I don't know how to do it, and I'm not confident enough to come to say to you, I don't know how to do it. It's different. It's then, do I care about others? And am I dependable? Do you know what I mean? Do I say to you, do you know what? I'm going to miss the deadline because this has happened or that's happened. Not wait for me to miss the deadline. And then you come and find me and go, why have you missed the deadline? That wasn't a good bike ride. That was horrific, too long, too short, whatever. So there are some really good questions. The Ken Blanchard book I do really highly recommend. I don't get any sponsorship for that and yeah. things. And also what's right for you, what's right for your engagement. Look at the big picture stuff. Um, so yeah. the big one with trust though, is just be transparent, be fair and be consistent. They're my three, you know, and if you can measure that across your organization at the start, along someone's journey, you know, and you'll know for your own organization, the timelines, because in a startup, four weeks is a year compared to yeah. a large, large company. So yeah, yeah. but they're, they're, the, they're the big ones if that helps. So really helpful. I've scrolled lots of notes down as well. And I hope for our audience, you've, you've enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes and sort of summarise the, the, the points today. But um, Sarah, I'm sure it's absolutely fine that if anybody is interested in kind of looking at some of the points you said or understanding what some of those questions are, then get in touch with Stribe and we'll pass them on to you. And vice yeah. versa, if you've got different cohorts of staff and you're just wanting to understand whether they do trust your organisation or whether there's any areas um, of suspicion or any opportunities, it doesn't have to all be negative, it can be the other side of it as well, then we can support you on some of these kind of pulse questions and surveys to get those insights to that kind of macro team level. And then Sarah can really work through that individual point of view to really work with the teams as, as, as we go through too. So the three points I took away to them at the end again was that transparency. Trust is indeed being transparent, you know, being fair, you know, if, if, if you're going to go to the gym, make sure the rest of the team can go to the gym at the same times or indeed around you and, and being really, really clear and being consistent, making sure that you're continuously kind of measuring this and working at it. And I think a lot of this is underpinned by communication. You know, the, 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 the trust will be a point in time. And if we stop saying, well, communicate with our teams and we just say, ah, oh, everyone trusts us, uh, you'll go from a best company award, <laughs> right from one down to not being on the list of the top 100 because it will just fall away. So it's this continuous flow and work that comes with it. But um, Sarah, thank you so, so much for your insights and your inputs. And like I say, I'll, we'll make sure that we introduce you to anybody that comes through the system. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic to welcome our audience today. And the timer is going off for on the hour <laughs> that we had. Um, I think it's clear to say that um, uh, Sarah will be bike riding with the gin this evening uh, as we join through. But <laughs> great I don't, even really, I don't even really bike riding. I mean, the gin drinking, yes, but the bike riding. But it's just a very good example. That it was a fantastic thing, so, example. Yeah. You know what? We'll all take that away. Thank you so, so much for your insights. But we hope you all have a, a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine if you are able to work in a hybrid world. And if you're not, then remember that your role is probably dictatable upon the service that you're delivering. Um, but we'll be working in the evenings when you're working the day delivering the, 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 the services that you do. So thanks so much. And we look forward to speaking to you all soon. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.